feeling casual vibes today because this week just needs to be over but then it's my brother's wedding this weekend so no rest no rest club another club another club just kidding but i am doing their wedding cake so that takes a lot of planning takes a lot of time a little stressful but it'll be fun i hope it turns out Fingers crossed. And I have to have someone come over and cat sit for the kitty. So that's stressing me out a bit. Um, I'm a bit of an overprotective mother with them because my entire sanity and happiness rests on their little shoulders. So what's up? It's McKay and today we're gonna be reacting to one star reviews of my favorite books on Goodreads. I saw this originally on Read by Lucy's channel. I'll tag her down below and I loved that video and I thought it was awesome and I was like, I wanna do this. Especially because a lot of my favorite books um, are a bit on the more taboo side, a bit on the more forbidden. I didn't even go like all the way extreme. I am thinking of making this like a series because I just have so many and I think I have some books. Like I'm thinking of doing like my favorite taboo books, one star reviews. My reading tastes sometimes can go a little extreme. So I'm interested to see. But today I picked some of my favorite books. We're gonna react to the one star reviews. I am just gonna preface this though. I am I was going back and forth on if I was gonna include like a screenshot of the review on the screen here with the person's name in it. And I've decided not to do that. Obviously these are like public reviews on Goodreads. So if you go on Goodreads, you can find these. Most of them I found within the first one or two pages of scrolling for each of these books. But I just didn't wanna attach anyone's names to it because granted while it is their review so i want to like give them credit i also know that the internet is like a wild place and i know that none of you here would go and do this but you just never know and i don't want to unknowingly like send someone after someone's review and like if someone saw this and got mad and went online and like attacked this reviewer it's just it's unnecessary it's not the vibe here we don't do that so I'm gonna keep those off of there, but obviously if you want to go on Goodreads and look them up yourself, they are public reviews, so. And obviously even though these are my favorite books, no book that I read and no book that is published is above critique. Every single book that I'm gonna review today or that I looked up, I rated five stars. But just because it's a five star read for me doesn't mean that it's gonna be a five star read for everyone. Obviously these people don't feel the same way and that's totally fine. It's a book, we can all have different opinions. Let's just be respectful. Let's waste no more time because I tend to do that and let's just jump right in. I do have my laptop here and the first one that I'm gonna be looking at is Birthday Girl by Penelope Douglas. I love this book. Probably my favorite book of Penelope Douglas's so far, but we're gonna look it up. So the review that I found is rating it two stars because I did have some criteria when I was looking for reviews. I didn't want any reviews that had DNF in it. Cause I'm like, then you didn't really get the full experience. I don't read the whole thing. I'm gonna kind of pick and choose the parts that we'll talk about here. They say that they love Penelope Douglas, but this one just didn't work for them, which I get. Like sometimes a book comes out by an author, like for example, Saffron Kent. I love Medicine Man and The Unrequited. Like two of my favorite books last year that I ever read. One of my all time favorite student teacher books, one of my all time favorite taboo books. However, Dreams of 18, I hate it. <laughs> like, I don't hate books, but I hated that book. So there are hit or miss books for authors, so I get that. Okay, so in their review, they say, I knew this was a taboo love story and I expected it to be fun, thrilling, but it was boring, annoying, a drag, and not taboo, but just wrong. I hate cheaters, but for me, an emotional cheater is a cheater as well, and it is actually worse than physical cheating. I do not know why only Cole got the blame for cheating when she drooled over his dad and did way worse things thinking about him. They were both wrong. I agree to this to an extent. Jordan definitely did have thoughts and feelings kind of building for Pike while she was still dating Cole. I even forgot that it was his name. I was like, you're irrelevant. But however, I don't really feel like it ever went too extreme while they were still together. So in my eyes, like kind of there, but also I don't really think Jordan's in the wrong for that either because Cole was a piece of shit. I don't know. I'm probably just making excuses because that's how I am. Jordan is one of the most annoying, whiny, needy characters that I've ever read about. She was literally a brat. I don't agree with that. I thought Jordan was a pretty strong heroine. I feel like Penelope Douglas writes pretty strong heroines. And I don't recall Jordan ever being bratty or ever coming across that way. She is 19, but I never really noticed her being like a brat. I thought she was actually a really mature heroine. And I think that's why her and Pike worked 
because while she was only 19, she felt a lot older and she had a maturity level higher than that. And I think that's what kind of drew Pike in was that she wasn't super childish. So I don't know if I agree with that. Pike was a good person and father, but he at the same time did not know a thing about parenting and he did not even try to. He was more worried about his heart on than his son's whereabouts. I just did not buy this story. <laughs> I don't think Pike's gonna get any father of the year awards, but also it's like your son's an adult. So yeah, he's living at home, but like he is an adult and he can do his own thing. So I don't think Pike needed to be bring, breathing down his neck 24 seven. So again, that never bothered me either. It was super slow paced and uneventful. It was just a book about a horny teenager and a needy, almost middle-aged guy, both immature and stupid. And for the former one was a brat as well. Overall, I'm just disappointed because I had high expectations. Okay. <laughs> book about a horny teenager and a needy, almost middle-aged guy. Both immature. I don't think either of them were immature, but again, they never struck me as immature. I mean, there's a lot of angst. There's a lot of buildup. Um, I liked that though. So yeah, I would disagree with a lot of the stuff in this review, but obviously this experience is this experience and I just treasure Birthday Girl as just a supreme read in my book. I think I'll probably include balance in my like really taboo favorite reads, one star reviews. But I wanted to choose because Balance is full of one star reviews and bad reviews because a lot of people then will go on it like after hearing the material and rate and like rate it one star without even reading it. And I'm like, well, that's kind of pointless. So I went with Twist, which is book four in the Off Balance series. It's my favorite book in there. So I wanted to see because I'm like, if someone is at book four, they've probably at least read it and are like kind of dedicated at this point. So I looked up this one and <laughs> this one, this person who rated it one star, short and sweet. Everyone in this book is stupid. I can't even war a review. I think they meant to say right, but can't even war a review. Um, okay, you know, Rhea doesn't make the best choices and I will never be able to say that I agree with a lot of her choices. And I think part of it has to do with her age. I think part of it just is who Rhea is. Um, and I will say that in Twist, I did get frustrated with her. I can't really defend it. All I'll just say is that, you know, she doesn't make the best choices, but do, do I still love the hell out of this book? Absolutely, yes. So this person rated it one star as well, but it's a little bit more of a lengthy review. They uh, did a little more. And so they said that this is this story is dragging on and on. There's really no need for five books. There are pages and pages of gymnastics training that it gets rather tedious. I do agree with that. They are extremely long books. For me personally, I don't mind. I like the gymnastics training. I really like the sports aspect of these books, but I do agree that it is, it is a lot. It's definitely wordy, but I personally didn't mind it. Koba's character changed in the last book and now he's quite a soppy character. <laughs> I liked his character progression a lot. Um, is he a lot softer? Yes, but I think the time kind of calls for it for him to be, especially where Rhea is at in this book. I think she needs more of a support than like a sparring partner, if you will, like she did in the first book. Okay, now this I highly disagree with. They said it could easily have been told over two books, which I'm sure was the original plan. I highly disagree with that. I think if this would have been two books, it would have been so unbelievably rushed. There's so much that happens with Rhea's family, so much that happens with Kova and his own personal relationships, so much between Rhea and Kova that goes on, so much in Rhea's personal life. And it would just have felt so rushed, especially for her to get to World Cup and then start where she did at her gymnastics skill to then by the second book already be like at the Olympics. It would have been way too rushed, way too fast. I think it was originally supposed to be a trilogy. Even then, I feel like it would have been kind of rushed. I definitely disagree that it should have been two books. That would have been a no. Okay, next up, one of my all-time favorite books, Sweet Dandelion by Macaulay Smeltzer. They gave it a 1.5 stars. Said this book was Wattpad level to the max, very cheesy and unrealistic. The heroine annoyed the fuck out of me and with her throwing herself a pity party every chapter with some odd arcane dialogue every scene break. I know she went through a tragedy, but there's a difference between saying you're depressed and actually being depressed and your actions have to coincide with your thoughts. That does not mean being super depressed one sentence and totally fantasizing about your about your counselor the next. 
I was never annoyed by Danny. I thought Danny's story was beautiful and I really liked seeing her growth over the course of the series or over the course of the series, over the course of the book. And I don't think her depression feels like fake in any ways. I personally thought it felt very realistic and a good depiction of it. And just because you're depressed doesn't mean that you sit around all day and say, I'm depressed. Because if I did, I wouldn't be making any YouTube videos. We're not going there on here. If you want to hear tangents like that, you can check out my podcast, Popcorn Chats, where my co-host and I just reminisce about our issues <laughs> before we talk about movies. I just don't think like depressed people, anxious people don't just sit around all day and that's their only train of thought. Like they have time to entertain other thoughts throughout the day. So I don't think her fantasizing about Lachlan takes away from her being depressed. Um, they said that uh, actually this book could have totally been cut in half if it wasn't so repetitive with all these small random details. It was unnecessarily long and ultimately boring. For me, I like the details. I don't think it was unnecessarily long. It is a big book, but I think it's much more of a character driven story, which why I think some people that's just not going to be their thing and they will get bored with the mundane details. But for me, I feel like that builds character and I appreciate those things in a book more so than I appreciate like a really plot twisty story. They also have a big long paragraph. I'm not going to read it, but talking about some of the stuff between Danny and Lachlan, their relationship to me never felt weird. Um, again, though, I am, I do like more taboo books and what I uh, read in fiction, I don't condone in real life. But in this, Danny is 18, like she's an adult in Lachlan. I don't know. I don't know how old he is. Is he like 29, maybe? A really slow burn of a relationship. So I felt their connection. I felt their chemistry. Um, I didn't think that them hugging on the fifth session was weird, as she pointed out. I don't know. They said just make it less far-fetched. I never felt like anything was that far-fetched. So I don't know. This book wasn't for them, but it is totally for me and one of my all-time faves. This is getting long. I was planning on doing nine books, but I think I'm gonna <laughs> save some of these for a separate part because it's already getting kind of long. I think I'll save Twisted Pride for the taboo one because it is a kidnapper kidnapping kind of situation. Um, so maybe we'll save that one. Okay, you know, this is kind of a good one to tail off of Sweet Dandelion and that is The Spectacular Now by Tim Tharp. Probably not a lot of people have read this book, but maybe you guys have seen the movies with the movie with Shailene Woodley and Miles Teller. One of my all time favorite books, one of my all time favorite movies. I love this story so much and I love Sutter Keeley so much. He's one of my all time favorite literary characters. This reviewer does not stand Sutter Keeley the way I do. They rated it one star as well. There was no plot. He just kept telling stories that didn't build anything. I'd often catch myself daydreaming while reading. Um. Again, this is a very character driven story and not a plot driven story. So I think if you're expecting plot, you would probably have the same feeling. But like I said, for me, as I will say time and time again, I love character driven story and I like Sutter's little tangents and stories that he tells. And this book has no conflict. Sorry, your main character being an alcoholic doesn't cut it as a main conflict. I agree, but also I didn't feel like there needed to be some giant conflict. It was more about the little things that were affecting Sutter that kind of built up and how he dealt with them rather than some big bomb get dropped in the book and it becomes this huge plot turning point. It was just a lot more subtle. He talks about not remembering what happened the previous night when he was obviously blackout drunk. Anyone who knows anything that being blackout drunk, you cannot drive safely. You can't even walk, but this kid somehow does it every day with no consequences. The teens are reading this book and thinking it's no big deal. Um, okay, I definitely don't think this glorifies like alcohol in general that like Sutter's a pretty sad character so I don't think he's necessarily glorifying anything obviously like drinking and driving is never okay but there are obviously people who do it and have never had an accident so far I say like yet because obviously like you should just never be doing this so I don't think that it's far-fetched though that Sutter goes out to a party and drinks and drives home and gets home without any incident because obviously that does happen but all it takes is one time to like completely rip apart someone's life so just don't do that and i don't condone that with sutter obviously in the book it never like glorifies it of being like oh he's so cool he's the most amazing driver like it's like he's like a pretty sad dude yeah and they clearly didn't like this book i love it it's one of my favorites i normally read it every year i didn't read it last year 
and I'm disappointed that I didn't. Okay, next up is The Mistake by L. Kennedy. It's the second book in the Off Campus series. My favorite book personally. Um, so this person gave it two stars. So one of the biggest issues I had with this book was the way the author portrayed college life and the character's stupidity that resulted because of a shallow, inaccurate, and offensive portrayal. And they include a quote from Logan, I'm allowed to hook up. No, I should be hooking up because that's what college is all about. Having fun and getting laid and enjoying the fuck out of yourself before you go out into the real world and your life turns to shit. I mean, I'm in the real world and it's no fun. So Logan, I get it. I mean, do I read that? And am I like, do I ever wanna hear a man in real life say that? No, but John Logan can say whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> to me. Here's the thing, he's like a college athlete. Like, I don't really have the highest expectations for him. So I didn't get bothered by it. I mean, he's like 21 years old, he's immature. I, I, I don't care. For the character, I'm kind of like, it's fine. And then they go to talk about how Grace talks about being a virgin in college and how that kind of is like built up in her character. And I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing that they taught that like Grace's character was kind of like conscious of losing her virginity. I feel like that's something that people can relate to. Can you not chew that cord? I feel like Grace is someone that like people can relate to with that experience. So again, I'm not mad at that. And it's not like Grace is like so obsessed. It's just on her mind of like, hey, she kind of feels like she's missing out a bit. And I don't think that's like that bad of a thing to have Grace concerned about. I don't know, I didn't care about that either. To build up on this aspect, the characters also made some really dumb and unbelievable choices that would make me scratch my head and go, huh. Um, she talks about how cheesy it is that Grace and Logan met like with him accidentally stumbling upon dorm room. Obviously, is that gonna happen in real life? No, but like, do I wanna read about them matching with each other on Tinder? Also, no. And then they said that it's unrealistic that then Grace would invite him to watch a movie with her. Honestly, I don't think so. I remember back in the dorms in college and people would kind of just like wander around and like go into other people's suites. I lived in like suite style dorms. So we had like four or five people per suite and then there were like some rooms in there and people would kind of just like go around and hang out in other people's suites. So I don't really find that that odd that like she invited him in, I don't know. Maybe that's a me thing. He mentioned a few other things and I said, these problems I mentioned above are all issues for me because of my inability to separate fiction from reality and how easily I'm able to compare and contrast the story setting along with the character age. So these things may very well not be issues for anyone else. We love a self-aware person. I think I almost separate fiction from reality, except when I was talking about The Wild by Kay Webster. I was like, this is so absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> The, I don't know, I think I've gotten pretty good at separating fiction from reality, especially when I'm reading like darker romance or taboo romances. And I've talked about that before and earlier on in this video that I don't really have an issue with that. So I think that's why some of these things I could just kind of brush away because I was just like, it's a book, I don't know. So my last one that I'm gonna do here, I have more, but I'm gonna cut it here. And it's Kill Switch by Penelope Douglas, which is the third book in the Devil's Night series. So one of the main problems that they point out that they had with this, I have many problems with this book. First, the scene between Will, Winter, and Damon. I mean, what's wrong with this author? The first book had a scene between Michael, Rika, and Kai. It's like a pattern. The first book had a sex scene between three people. The second book didn't, and the third book had it. Although Damon and Winter scene was different, it didn't make any sense. No, I totally disagree with this. Yes, there's the pattern, but in Corrupt, I think it's a very specifically needed scene for Kai and setting up Kai for the next book that I don't feel like that scene was just thrown in for the sake of spice or for the shock value of it. I think it served a purpose. And I think that even more with this scene between Winter, Damon, and Will after they crash off the icy bridge and then they go in the showers. The only thing, it's like Damon is very possessive. So at first I was kind of like, is he really gonna like let Will be with Winter? But I mean, he kind of finessed his way around that a bit. Will and Damon are very, very close as seen throughout the book and they just have a special bond that, they, that none of the other guys have. So I liked that Will in this book is like spiraling. Like he's spiraling from the beginning of the series, but in this book especially, like you just see him 
going into a really bad place. And I feel like Damon in Winter really tried to pull him out of that and show him like, hey, you still have a place with us. Like we still love you, we care about you. And I don't think that the scene felt weird. I actually thought it was like, yeah, it was spicy, but I actually thought it was like a really good scene. I'm glad it was included. And I thought it made sense. And I don't think it was in there for the sake of being in there. However, I will say with Nightfall, the train scene that I don't necessarily get as much. Don't think that that one made much sense and I can't really like figure out a reason of why that was included. Um, I didn't not like it, <laughs> but I'm just saying that one, if someone set, brought up that scene, I wouldn't really be able to defend it. But with this scene, I really do think it was necessary for Will and Damon's characters. She also talks about, they also talk about how Winter sleeps with Damon without knowing his name and how that seemed weird at the beginning of the book and how Winter was like judging her sister for being easy but then sleeps with Damon without knowing his name. I'm trying to remember, I don't really even remember her sister that much. So I don't really remember Winter being like super judgy towards her sister but also like I said, I just, I don't really remember Winter's sister that well. I actually kind of forgot that she was originally married to Damon. <laughs> weird but the scene at the beginning i think it's like i think it was more about winter kind of needing to prove something to herself a bit and kind of get a little bit of like affection and love and damon was obviously there and they already like she kind of had an idea of who he was i don't know i don't really remember that i i don't remember being bothered by that i don't really, really remember having like any issues with this book because it's just a plus. Oh, look who came to say hi. She's a wild little girl. Oh, Miss Aria, I love you. Oh, are you gonna stay up here by me? Thank you, that's so sweet. Oh, you're kind of wild. I don't really think you want to settle down. I think you want to play. All right, those are all the ones that I'm gonna do today. I guess, of course, I got carried away talking because that's how it goes. So I'm definitely gonna make more parts of these and I'm for sure gonna be doing like my favorite taboo reads because I feel like those reviews are some of the most fun because people tend to like rip some of those books apart and I want to read and react to those specifically. So we'll definitely do more of these coming up. Um, I think it's a fun idea. If you're at the end here, thanks for sticking it out with me and I will see you when I see you.